Hi, welcome to An Open Mind. I'm Anita Burns. My guest today is David Lintner. David Lintner and I go way, way back. In fact, David Lintner and I used to be married a long time ago. Now he is my best friend. David's an interesting person, as uh, you probably already guessed, because I have only interesting people on this show. <laughs> he started his journey uh, very far from where he is now. And I'm going to let him talk to you a little bit more about that. Welcome, David. Thank you, Anita. <laughs> way, way back. <laughs> way, way back. Way, way back before before we both had gray hair. Only right. I cover mine up. <laughs> Do I have gray hair? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one there. There's one there. So I thought the the people might be a little interested to to hear your story about how you how you came from Lutheran minister to Kabbalist, Taoist, metaphysical, tarot reader, all-around all weird guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I was born weird. Yeah. So that's been a part of it. Um, well, the journey. The journey from Lutheran pastor mm -hmm. to here started one Sunday morning in Houston when I was standing in the sacristy of the church getting ready for communion and I was putting on all of my layers all of my costumes um, it was Did you a, have the pointy hat? I don't know. I didn't have the pointy hat. <laughs> I had the pointy head but I didn't yeah. have the pointy hat. I'm gonna get emails from Catholics now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, I looked in the mirror to make sure that everything was neat and straight and in order. This all the the alb and the chasuble and the stole and everything. And as I looked in the mirror, I heard a voice. And the voice said, You're putting yourself on. Mm -hmm. And I got it. I absolutely <laughs> understood at that moment that I was putting on a self and that I really had no clue about what was underneath that self that I was putting on. Mm -hmm. So I took the vestments off. I, I just took everything off at that moment. Did you go out and do the service naked? No. <laughs> no, not naked, but um, just in my uh, shirt and, and trousers. And the congregation was used to a lot of different stuff. Okay. It was a congregation that had gone through a lot of change. They were a multiracial congregation. And so they were, they were interested in the unusual. So this was just another um, example of something weird that... Did they ask you about it afterwards or um, just like... Yes, they okay. did. And um, so I explained it and everyone sort of was okay with that. <laughs> so I had that experience. And then, um, sometime later, I was sitting in a play in mm -hmm. Houston, uh, The Cocktail Party by T.S. Eliot. And as I was sitting in this play, all of a sudden I went into a trance. And I knew that the play was about reincarnation. Now, what's unusual about that is I knew nothing about reincarnation. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I knew about, essentially, was the Lutheran Church and other Christian churches. And um, so I sat there and I watched, and the main character in this play had a very difficult decision that she had to make. And depending on the decision that she made, she would either advance or she would go back to the life that she'd lived. And she made the decision to go on. And as I looked at this, sitting in this dark theater, I had a vision. And the vision was of a kind of a blue-green luminous egg mm -hmm. with these dark areas in it. And as I looked at it, I knew that what I was looking at was my soul. Hmm. And that the dark areas in the, the image were... Uh, bruises, if you will, of my soul that represented things that I really wasn't dealing with, mm. things that I wasn't being honest with about myself. Um, uh, I was just not congruent with what I thought I believed and what I was doing. So 
I knew at that moment I had a choice to make, and that was I either start dealing with what I was trying to ignore, or I could go on. And I decided to deal with what was, what was happening in my life. And I made a list, and I was going to start immediately that night by dealing with some of the very difficult things that uh, were going on. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I finished making that list, and I vowed that I would begin that night, I heard the voice again. <laughs> and the voice said, it's about time. <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of uh, what comes to mind and gives me a whole new meaning to, I think it was George Bernard Shaw that said, the play is the thing. <laughs> the play is the thing, yes, <laughs> definitely the thing. So how long ago was that about? Oh, that was um, back in the very early 80s. Mm. Um, the next day, after the play, I went to this metaphysical bookstore, The Aquarian Age. Mm -hmm. I think you remember that yes, story. Yes, I do. In a little white house. A little white house. Full of cats. Cats, and the ladies in there kind of looked at. The sisters. They looked know, like sisters. Who, who is this person coming in? <laughs> and um, I would, I would uh, go to that store and sort of look on the shelves, not certain about why I was doing that. I never mm -hmm. bought anything until... That day, and I walked into the store, and I walked over to a shelf and picked a book off the shelf immediately, opened the book to a page, and looked down and read a description of what I had uh, experienced the night before. Wow. About a description <clears throat> of the soul and uh, what it looks like, and there are dark areas in the soul that are represent the things that we don't deal with in this life, and that if we don't, then after we die, we have to deal with it and learn and, and mm -hmm. reincarnate. So that was a very, very unusual experience for me. And I think it opened me up to uh, some realities that I typically had not experienced up to that point. I'd, I'd lived a kind of a, a typical Lutheran story, if you will, a Lutheran Christian story. Although even that for me was unusual because when I was in seminary I was uh, fortunate to have some experiences that were uh, unusual. I spent a summer on the East Coast as a leisure pastor, mm -hmm. um, an interdenominational thing with some people who were, were very interesting and, and I had some challenges dealing with what was going on there. Uh, I spent a year, my last year of seminary, as um, a student chaplain at a children's hospital. But that was uh, interesting. Well, it was very interesting because I dealt with things that I'd never had to deal with, children dying every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I had a burn unit that I was responsible for and a general medical unit. And I was on call in the evening. and. I had to confront some things about what I believed to be true mm -hmm. uh, versus the doctrine of the church. Yeah, I, was, I would think that that would really be food for thought. You know. yeah, it was, it was um, quite a series of emotional uh, encounters that I had that I think broadened my attitude mm -hmm. a great deal and um, so pushed me beyond what was acceptable and right. Um, so were you questioning at that time some of the things you learned in seminary or did that come later? Well I you know questioned why is it that children die? Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't seem to be fair. Uh -huh. And I don't know that that's necessarily the doctrine of the church as it was my own ignorance mm -hmm. uh, at never having encountered life and death like that before. Um, I did um, baptize a corpse one night, which is not exactly um, Now that's got to be acceptable. a good story. <laughs> well, I, I, since I was on call, um, the hospital called and there were parents whose child was dying and they wanted the child baptized mm -hmm. and would I please come. So I got in the car and I was going to the hospital and I was chewing over the theology of the church that taught that baptism is not a magical rite that mm -hmm. ensures your uh, entrance into heaven, but is more uh, a symbol of one's um, joining a community, the community of faith, and that we should never 
baptize anyone in an emergency situation because people thought they were going to go to hell, but we should counsel people. Well, here I arrive at the hospital, and the child has died. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I uh, don't have to deal with this. And the parents asked me, even though the child was dead, would I still baptize the child? Mm -hmm. And for some reason, in a split second, I said yes. So the nurse took me to the room where the, the child's body was. The parents didn't want to come with me. And she gave me a little paper cup and took me to the sink where I could get some water, and she left. And, and I thought, well, I could just say that I did it uh, and not do but it. But that's not you. I know you. Well, I made a promise, so <laughs> yeah. I did it. And uh, then went and sat with the parents. And after I thought about this later on, what I recognized was that it didn't make any difference to me what the church teaches. What mm -hmm. made a difference to me was about the people and where they were in that moment and what they needed. And I realized that this was the absolute last thing mm -hmm. that they knew to do for their child. Yeah. And so I did it, and I felt really guilty about it. Mm. Um, I thought I had, as far as the as the church was concerned, that I'd done something wrong, and, and I don't know that I would have been kicked out of seminary for it, but I kept it to myself, and I didn't tell anyone because I didn't, really didn't want to deal with it. Um, so I continued to have experiences like that, that um, my circle of who I defined in was larger and larger and larger, and that I, I couldn't exclude anyone because of their religious belief or non-belief. Didn't you baptize a non-Lutheran at one time, or am I remembering oh, wrong? Oh, yes. I, <laughs> bring them on, I'll, <laughs> I'll find them. So, so those experiences had been happening, and, and by the time I got to Houston and I had these experiences, I, I was well on my way to being open to, mm -hmm. to other ways of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. And then I met um, a woman who wanted to channel for me, and uh, this was unusual, and, and she uh, channeled a guide that she, whose name she said was Soma, and, and um, that I should look for a book with a cover of leaves changing, and I was real skeptical about all of this, although I've always looked for that book cover, <laughs> until I realized that I am the tree with leaves changing. Uh -huh. um, and, and then um, I bought a tarot deck, and I didn't know what that was about, and I looked at astrology, and I tried to correlate the tarot deck and astrology, and I didn't have the vaguest idea. So there was, was this metaphysician inside screaming to get out. Trying to wake up. <laughs> yeah. Um, because later, much later, I discovered how they correlate. Mm -hmm. And then I met uh, a woman who, over a plate of pork chops, <laughs> Uh, I ask about your metaphysical beliefs. <laughs> that would be me, yes. yes. And um, so we started that dialogue mm -hmm. and um, uh, became closer and eventually decided to move to California. Oh. The, um, and my friends in Texas thought I was, you know, they feared for my soul. <laughs> California. And I was moving back to California moving. after having been in Texas for right. six years. Right. Six long years. <laughs> I love some parts, some things about Texas I just absolutely love, but some things I could not take. Well, you like fossil hunting. I like fossil. I did not like the summers in Houston. No, no. Very humid. Humid, very humid, humid, humid. Yeah. Unlike this particular time in California where the summers are very hot and humid. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, coming to California and being involved with you and your mother and mm -hmm. her metaphysical center, the only metaphysical center named for a Mexican beer, <laughs> that was Corona Light, um, introduced me to... What's it named for a Mexican beer? Oh, I know that. It was named for a cigar. <laughs> As she says, <says>, cigar. <laughs> so, um, and then I had an encounter with the Vedanta Society and mm -hmm. the Swami Swahananda Someone introduced me to him, and, and I went to Swami 
utterly confused about everything that I was seeing and, and mm -hmm. hearing and um, asked him to help me become more spiritual. And he said, you already are spiritual. <laughs> well, I didn't have the slightest idea what he meant, but he taught me to meditate. And um, then I said something about how I, that was being asked to teach classes. And I didn't know about this stuff. And, and what should I do about this, in his opinion? And he said, teach. I said, I don't know about this. He said, someone has to do it. <laughs> so there was it's a, a dirty job, but somebody's got to uh, do it. <laughs> right. So uh, I did, and I started having dreams mm -hmm. and bought a, another tarot deck and really started to awaken to mm -hmm. a whole different realm of spirituality. And it was, which tarot deck? It was the Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn, great. Right. Um, Robert Wang's mm -hmm. Golden Dawn deck, and it was the Ace of Wands mm -hmm. that was just really evocative yeah. for me. So I started to study, and lo and behold, here I am, some 25 years later, yeah. um, with a different view of spirituality. And within that time, you've also become a neurolinguistic programming. Right trainer and right. developed your own uh, model called I'm, I mapping. Right. Uh, it, what is it? I mapping is identity identity, ma identity mapping. And um, you're an accomplished poet and a writer and uh, you just you're, you're like a renaissance man. Still like pork chops. Still like pork chops, right? Not a vegetarian, although you were for a while. Well, you and I both were vegetarians <laughs> yeah, I was for a while. Vegetarian for a long time, and um, you've had to traveled the world and and just had quite an adventurous adventurous life. So your 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 many experiences have come together. I can. They have, yeah. and NLP. Um, which you and I both started taking in Houston mm -hmm. way back in 82. Mm -hmm. That's where we met, as you remember. <laughs> do I you don't, remember? I do remember that, but I'm so bad with timelines. Right. I mean, it could have been, you know, 1914 as far as well, I know. It might have been. <laughs> I um, have time dyslexia. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> uh, yes. So, so um, what that was about, NLP was about, was the first time that I actually found a way of thinking and being mm -hmm. that made sense to me. Um, I'd gone to this therapist in Houston because I was under a lot of emotional pain over a relationship breakup and this guy has, uh, was on the radio and he was very successful and he was very expensive. And he must be good then. He, he <laughs> sat there for 15 minutes and he'd go, mm -hmm and pat me on the shoulder and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and we'd make another appointment. And in the middle of that, I got, a, um, or I had a, um, chest pains. Mm -hmm. And the doctor sent me for a um, treadmill test. And it wasn't my heart, it, it turned out to be stress mm -hmm. uh, over this uh, relationship breakup. He sent me to buy a book on transactional analysis. I I knew about transactional analysis, I'd used it, and I locked onto a book on the bookshelf about NLP called mm -hmm. Frogs into Princes. Oh yeah, and when Richard I, Bandler. When I opened it and read it again, I found exactly the description of what I had been thinking because I, what I realized is that the pain I had was something that I was creating. Mm -hmm. It was how I was uh, viewing the world, and that if I would change the way I thought about the world or experienced the world, then, then um, the pain would go away. Mm -hmm. And so I got a flyer in the mail from Mitha Singleton, our mentor, mm -hmm. and uh, went to see Mitha, made an appointment, and an hour later left her office remarkably changed. And I read the book. I went back to my other therapist for an appointment, and as we sat there, I recognized that he did not have a way of finding out what was happening inside me. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a, a way of understanding that structure of experience. So that was my last appointment and um, I learned everything I possibly could 
um, from Mitha. We both were mm-hmm. trainers' assistants, and oh, I remember the those full, days. The full, <laughs> the full thing, and it gave me an opportunity then to think about uh, how we create our sense of self, mm-hmm. um, which goes back to childhood and the reason I chose to enter the ministry because I thought this was a persona mm-hmm. that I could wear. Um, my father, when, when I was a child, his favorite name for me was Fool. And, um, and when I discovered the church as a, as a child, a fundamentalist church, I found out I could be a fool for Christ and it would be acceptable. Um, and then later on, as I discovered the tarot, I discovered the fool as the spiritual journeyer. Mm-hmm. And so um, I began to look at how do we put this sense of self together and took the material that I'd learned from um, NLP and developed this model of identity um, that I call eye mapping or identity mapping, which has some very interesting results for people when they go through I'm really intrigued by it. It seems like... Neurolinguistic programming or NLP, a practitioner training, is is long and in depth, and it really trains you on how to use the technology uh, in a therapeutic sense or in your life or on other people. It's like building a car from scratch, mm-hmm. and your eye mapping is like learning how to be a really good driver, <laughs> right? Knowing what you need to know to make life work for you. And uh, I've applied it in several, I mean, not several, but more than several, a lot of um, instances of my life uh, and contexts in my life, and it, it, it works. It's, just, it's simple, it's straightforward, and yet it is incredibly uh, deep at the same time. And it's a kind of like the central point around which all of the NLP patterns seem to mm-hmm. fit. Mm-hmm. Um, because when I was learning NLP, eventually I asked, well, what does this relate to? And the piece that was missing for me was the piece about what role do we play in life? And when I started to examine that, then I, what I modeled was a sense of identity and that all the NLP patterns relate to how we create this sense of self. Mm-hmm. And when you add that piece to it, it provides a, a, a much more intense focus for the work that, that you can do. Yeah, it's like you have a, um, an icon, I guess you might call it, a, a symbol of, of a ceiling fan, or I, to me it's a ceiling fan, it could be any mm-hmm. fan, I guess, with four blades, and um, each blade is labeled, right. and you can take any situation and, and, fit, and, and fit it into that to come to a conclusion, a change, a decision, um, an understanding about what that's all about. It's like for me, it helps to take away confusion because, like anybody, you know, I get into kind of loops of mm-hmm. of indecision. Should I? Shouldn't I? You know, what is this all about? And by taking that that and applying that map to it, it's like, well, of course, this is the way to go. Right. And um, I just think it's it's pretty nifty. And you have a you have a training coming up in that I know, and that is. Uh, um, well, we do ongoing training. Yeah, ongoing training. Yes. Right. And um, also, you still do training in NLP, and NLP you see training. We you do see NLP client. Training yeah, together. we do it together. We like frickin' frack. That's right. <laughs> and which which one are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never tell. Right. <laughs> which one is the beautiful, talented one? Me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then I'm the other one. Okay. Um, and you see clients. Uh, you do tarot readings. and Your tarot yeah. readings, though, are not just your typical lay the cards out and, and read them the way most psychics do. You really bring a lot of, a lot of depth and counseling and your knowledge of, of uh, the human, human experience to it. And I've seen people right. leave... Uh, after having a reading with you with tears in their eyes, it's really been a transformational experience. Either that or you slapped them around. <laughs> <laughs> well, oftentimes when a person starts to cry, then it, it seems to me like 
a door has opened mm -hmm. and um, they are sharing something that's very deep and very personal. Mm -hmm. And so I look at the tarot and NLP and whatever mo modality that I'm using as a way to help bring some resolution to um, that part of a person's life. Uh, it's not about whether you're going to get a job or uh, leave your spouse or whatever. Um, I think it goes much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. So usually in a very short period of time we get to the, the deeper part and help that person experience some healing. Use that and at the same time I'm using Ray Hutek, yeah, uh -huh. the Ray Hutek energy to mm -hmm. um, energize the Well the that work. brings a lot to the table too, yeah, it's just sort it of, does. you know, steroids for anything. <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So David, um, if someone would want to get in touch with you and learn more about you, how would they do that? Uh, they can email me mm -hmm. at um, nlp underscore imap at mac.com mm -hmm. or they can look at my website which is df lintner mm -hmm. nlp.com okay thank you very much you're welcome thank you <laughs> thank you for joining us and please remember to subscribe to our show so you don't miss a moment of all the wonderful things we bring to you goodbye <laughs>